at ServiceNow Knowledge Store Team is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. We're here live at Moscone South, and uh, this is the Knowledge 14 conference. 6,600 people here uh, growing. It was about, about 4,000 last year. You're seeing this conference grow at about the same pace as, uh, as services, ServiceNow's top line. They're growing at 60% uh, plus on pace to do over 600 million in revenue this year, on pace to be a billion dollar company. And we have the CFO here, Mike Scarpelli, a Cube alum. Mike, great to see you again. Thank you. So this is amazing. I mean, Moscone is a great venue. Uh, uh, the Aria last year was kind of intimate, mm -hmm. you know, and now you're really sort of blowing it out. Um, I would expect uh, next year you're going to be into, into the big time of conferences. <laughs> this thing, so. Well, you got I, a budget for that. <laughs> we, we, we definitely have a budget. I know it's going to cost more, just like the attendance is going up 50, 60 percent. The costs are going up as well, too. But our, our partners are really important, and our partners offset a lot of those costs. We'll get over $8 million in sponsorship revenue to offset that. So when we expect next year, we'll see a corresponding increase in the sponsorship revenue as well. Well, it's impressive. You have a lot of strong partners, particularly uh, the system integrator consultancy types. You know, we saw, and I hope I don't miss some, but we definitely saw Accenture there last night. We saw Ernie Young giving a presentation. Uh, KPMG, KPMG, obviously, is a, Cloud, a, a, a Cloud big, Sherpas. Yeah, the Cloud Sherpas. And so we had them on earlier. So you have a lot of these facilitators, which is a great sign for you. I mean, they're realizing, okay, there's, there's money to be made around the ServiceNow ecosystem, helping customers implement. So that's going to make you really happy. No, um, you know, one of the things that's, that's really important for us with the system integrators is today, they haven't really brought us many deals, but they've been very uh, influential in accelerating deals. And we think that theme is going to continue. And based upon what they're seeing they're able to do in the ServiceNow ecosystem in terms of professional service consulting engagements, we think that's going to start to motivate them to now bring us into deals that we were never in before. But what they have been able to do as well, besides just accelerate, is have the deals grow beyond IT. And we see that numerous um, um, Global 2000 accounts for us. And you're not trying to land grab the professional services business. That's clear. In fact, when you talk to some of your customers, when, I remember last year one of your customers was complaining that your, 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 your price is real high on the services side, which mm -hmm. probably makes you happy because it leaves more room for, you, for your partners. And that's really not a... Uh, a, a, a long-term uh, piece of your revenue. I think you've said publicly you want it to be less than 15% of your business, right? Yes, yes. We have a little bit of a uh, ongoing debate internally. My preference is not to see the professional service organization grow in terms of headcount. Uh, with the pure implementation people, the area that I would like to see it grow is more on the training side. Mm. Um, unfortunately, some of our customers, they insist that we are part of the professional service engagement. So those are more the ones that we're going to be involved in. If a customer is looking for a lower cost alternative, uh, we want to make it um, fair for our partners so that we're not competing with them so they can come in with a lower price to offer a good quality service. It's important though that it's not going for the lowest price. Our, our partners need to make investments so it can be a quality implementation. Because there's a number of early implementations that were done by partners that were uh, some of our smaller partners where they really didn't um, meet the, uh, the, the, the expectations of those customers. And we've had to go in and fix some of those um, engagements. So the number one goal for our professional service is to ensure we have happy customers because happy customers renew and buy more which are two of the key drivers for our growth. So you keep growing like crazy, uh, blew it out last quarter, I think you had 181 million in, in billings, revenue's up 60 plus percent, uh, you're throwing off cash, uh, hitting all your metrics, and of course the stock went down. <laughs> and, uh, so there you go, uh, not much more you could do, but uh, you gotta really be pleased with the consistent performance and really predictability, it seems, of, uh, of the company. Yeah, no, I'm, um, since I've been the CFO of the company, it's gonna be, um, um, coming on three years soon this summer. Um, the one thing that I will say about this business model is it's extremely predictable in terms of the, uh, the forecasting. Um, and what helps with that is the fact that we have such high renewal rates. Um, that really helps because uh, we really, since I've been here, we've never lost any major accounts. I think our renewal rate has been averaging north of 95%. Um, and in terms of our upsells, our upsells have been very consistent um, on average, they run about a third of our business every quarter, and that was, um, um, Frank has made comments before too, that if we don't sign on another customer, we can still grow 25% per year plus, 
just based upon the upsell business opportunity that we have within our existing installed base of customers. And that's penetrating accounts deeper, more seats, more licenses, more processes and applications? Is yeah, that the, the, the main grower of our um, uh, upsells, or the main contributor to our upsells within our customers really has been additional seat licenses because many of our customers, we still haven't even fully penetrated IT. And as we roll out more applications or make our applications more feature rich, as we talked about, um, as Frank in his keynote, he talked a little bit today about uh, IT costing. We've always had that as an application, but that's going to be coming out as a much more feature rich application that's going to be a lot more usable to some of our customers. Well, when that goes live, that's going to drive more licenses because many times it's different people within IT that are the process users behind that. And then it's going outside of IT as well with the adoption of the whole enterprise service management concept that Frank's been um, talking about. That will drive incremental users as well too. We do have some additional products such as orchestration discovery, but the vast majority of our growth in customers is additional licensing. So very consistent performance. Um, like I say, the stock pulled back a little bit. It's interesting. You guys, Workday, Splunk, Tableau, smoking hot stocks, have all pulled back. You almost, it's almost like you trade as a group, even though yeah. completely different companies, completely different business models. You yeah. don't compete really at all. Um, but so you kind of got to be flattering to be you know in that group, yeah. obviously. But it's, I looked at it as, actually this is good in a way. This is a healthy you know, pullback. It's maybe a buying opportunity for people that wanted to get in and there are a lot of folks that I'm sure that are, that are looking at that. Do you, I mean, how much attention do you even pay for it? I know most CFOs I talk to say, look, we can't control it. All we can control is you know, what we can control and that's what we focus on. But do you even look yeah. at things like that? Do you, do you what, what are your yeah. thoughts on You on know, that and that unfortunately pullback? there is a little bit of a, um, um, a psychology going on here with some of our employees and they're always asking and mm -hmm. my comment to them is the only price that matters is the day you sell. And um, this pullback that we've seen recently, this is not uncommon. Uh, was I expecting it to happen right now? You know, I don't, if I, if I could predict those things, I'd wow. be in a different line of business. But what I will say, it, history is the best indicator of the future. And even a company like um, Salesforce.com, one of our large investors last week, he sent me an email and said, you do realize that in the first five years of Salesforce being a public company, it had, I forget if it was four or five, 50% pullbacks in its stock price. So this, this happens, it will happen. I'm, I guarantee it'll happen again sometime in the future, but not just with us, with all the other companies. I'd be more concerned if it was, uh, we were the only company that traded down and everyone stayed up, but we're, we're all trading down. We all came back today. It's interesting, and, and you kind of burned the shorts last year, and they've made some money now, but, but you know, Peter Lynch used to say, don't ever short great companies. And yeah. uh, it's very hard to, to short great companies. Your timing has to be perfect. So, uh, and, and your core business, you know, like for instance, a, a workday is is fundamentally very profitable, or mm -hmm. you know, sh it should be right. And because you're spending like crazy on sales and marketing, you're expanding into into AP, you're, you're expanding your total available market, uh, and you're still throwing off cash. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. You had yeah. said off camera your goal is to to really be you know sort of throw off a little cash and basically be cash flow break even. Yes. Right? Yes. So. Um, you know, you can only grow at um, a certain pace. Last quarter, we added 150 new people into our sales and marketing organization. That was the, uh, the largest number that we've ever added in one quarter. We actually added 273 net new employees in Q1. That was the most we've ever added in a quarter. And even with all of those ads, we still had very good positive cash flow. So it, it's pretty hard to add at any faster pace than what we're doing right now. Um, and so, um, you know, I just, I don't see us being cash flow negative um, any time in the future right now, unless something happened, and right, it'd have to be a pretty major catastrophe, I think, and it's not going to be specific to service now, it'll be kind of across the board where all CIOs stop spending. And um, the other thing I learned here, I, maybe I just wasn't paying attention to earlier conference calls, but the AP focus, uh, a large percentage of the Global 2000 is in Asia Pacific. So you're out nation building right yes. now. I wonder if you could talk about that a little sure. bit. Sure, so in 2000, and, um, from uh, March 31st, 2013 till March 31st, 2014, we opened up in 10 new countries. Most of those were in Asia Pacific. There's still more countries we're going to be going into in Asia Pacific. And why are we going into these countries? We're going into these countries because that's where the Global 2000 accounts are. That is our strategy because we focus on quality of customers, not quantity of customers. What I mean by quality, a quality customer is one that can grow over time to be a very large customer. 
Um, and even in 2013, we went into um, Italy, and people said at the time, well, why are you going into Italy? Um, we went into Italy because they have Global 2000. They have 30-something Global 2000 accounts. Even though the Italian economy wasn't doing well, Global 2000 customers still spend. It's not specific to that country. They're global. We signed two Global 2000 accounts in Italy last quarter. So we, we have a history of showing that if we go into those countries, we will be successful in winning those Global 2000. And we'll continue. There are some Global 2000s, though, in geographies where it's going to take some time before we actually have a physical presence, such as mainland China. We do not have any salespeople in mainland China today. Russia, we do not have any people in Russia today. How about so, the Ukraine? No, we have, we have no one in Ukraine today. <laughs> uh, the good thing about Italy, you get to go visit there. That's right? true. Visit the old country. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about the TAM. Yes, the, uh, last, last year we had, I kind of botched it, but, but I was asking Colombo questions about the TAM because it was you know, very interesting. Um, I saw a lot of potential. I wanted to try to understand how big it could be. You and I talked about, you had said it's north of 8 billion. Uh, of course, the, the, the stock took off. I think it probably hit 10 billion from a value standpoint. I did a, my own TAM uh, mid-year. I did a blog post. I had it up to 30 billion. So I, mm -hmm. I started to understand. It was a top down, though. It wasn't mm -hmm. a bottom up. Uh, but you guys are starting to sort of communicate <coughs> the, the, to him a little bit differently. You got, had the help desk and then beyond that, the IT service management. And then you've, you've essentially got the operations, sure. IT operations management, and even now sort of enterprise and business management. So I wonder if you could talk about how you look at the, the TAM and any attempts that you've made to quantify it. Sure, so there's really um, um, four markets we play in that really intersect with one another. And the core of our market is the IT service management. That's kind of our beachhead and how we go into accounts. Um, and that market right now, when historically, when we went public, the Gartner Groups of the World, they looked at it as a help desk replacement market. And they were saying it's a 1.4 to $1.6 billion market. What they were missing is there's many other things in that space, IT service management, such as PPM, such as our CMDB, such as asset management. A lot of these things aren't in your traditional help desk. We think, based upon the rate at which we've been extracting from the market, it's somewhere between a four to six billion dollar market opportunity, just IT service management. And then IT service management is a subset of the overall enterprise service management market that Frank has been talking about, we talked about it in our analyst day. We think that is potentially as high as 10x the size of our IT service management. So that, that can get you up to say that $40 billion mm -hmm. plus. And then you as well have the IT operations management space. IT service management, you just have the legacy vendors down there, nothing innovative happening down there. Service relationship, a lot of white space, a lot of stuff that's being done in email, Lotus Notes, Microsoft Access, SharePoint, those are the markets we're going after. There really are no true systems in, in, um, in, in, that, in that space. It's those one-off custom apps. IT operations management, there is a lot of innovation happening down that, in that space. It is very um, um, crowded with some new vendors as well as the legacy vendors. The area that we'll plan won't be the whole $18 billion market that IDC talks about. You know, it's still early innings, but it's at least $2 billion of that market to $4 billion we'll be going after. And then Frank brought up this concept of the whole business analytics as well, too. We talked about, we, we did our acquisition of Mirror 42 in uh, 2013, and the business analytics kind of sits at the top of um, enterprise service relationship management. The market we can go after in there, that's a, that's a whole market into itself, at least as big as the enterprise service management, but we're not going after that whole market. It's just the business analytics to the extent it relates to enterprise service management, so that's at least a couple billion more. Unfortunately, this is what we believe. There is no published reports out there and time is, is going to tell. It's similar to when Salesforce went public. No one believed the opportunity in front of it, and now look how big that company right. is, $30 billion plus company. Valuations are, you know, <clears throat> depends on what time of year it is and what the market's doing, but the, over the long term, you know, you can sort of do valuation analysis. In, in the CFO world, is there some kind of thought in terms of the ratio between an organization's TAM and its, and its valuation? You know, I, I mean, there's other things, uh, growth rate, obviously, uh, leadership, et cetera, yeah. but, but for the top companies, yeah. is there a relationship? I, I, I personally don't get wrapped up in valuation. Um, you know, I can't control that. I can't control public company multiples. The only thing we have control over is running our own business, and we're going to stay very focused on running our business and let other people um, take care of the valuation. I mean, you're a good business. You picked a good one. Yes, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm very pleased with this one. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Mike. Well, listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. We're up against the clock, and I uh, always appreciate you Thank taking you, your time up. All right, Thank keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next right. guest. We're live from Moscone South. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back.